Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Unifying the DoD Network Theater Session at TechNet Cyber. My name is Casey Smoyer. I'm a program manager at Mantech. It is my pleasure to support AFCIA and to introduce our next speaker. Uh, happy to introduce our speaker for the next session, uh, Ms. Molly Barsic, DoD Net PMO Deputy. Ms. Barsic is helping drive DISA's premier customer service through IT solutions and delivering DoD Net's defense defense agencies and field agencies, or DAFAs. It's my pleasure again to introduce Ms. Barsnick as she and the other speakers discuss how the department will advance their global posture to combat strategic threats. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very happy. Is this on? Yeah. Try again. Thank you. Good morning. Very happy to be here and uh, really happy to see such a large crowd at this early time. So appreciate you all coming out. <laughs> um, we, have a great, we have a great lineup of speakers here today. So before we begin, let me introduce our team. So we have our DOD Net Operations Chief, Miguel Cerritos Arison. And we're also joined by our Lidos Partners, Program Manager Chad Beekle and Chief Engineer Jonathan Brett. So we're very excited to be here again this morning, so thank you for coming out. So we're here to share how DISA is driving to provide premier customer service through IT solutions and delivering DOD's network to defense agencies and field agencies. By providing capabilities and parity across networks through simplifying network architecture and standardization on network services, the department will advance the global posture to combat strategic threats. And by adopting this common network architecture, users will have increased user experience, and that will be through enhanced tools and streamlined processes to improve traffic flow. They'll also have greater agility, and that's decreased hardware footprint that will enable automation. We'll also be able to provide enhanced security. That will be adaptive and sustainable threat protection. So enhancements from the DOD net generation one to generation two, it postures the agency to migrate component organizations more seamlessly and efficiently. And DOD net generation two is the priority capability that will enable modern enterprise and streamline operations across the globe. The Gen 2 Release 1 will build upon current strengths of Generation 1, and they'll add elements of scalability, interoperability, and redundancies to further enhance DoD net capabilities. So that's enough for me. Let's hear more from the team. Miguel, I have the first question for you. So for those in the audience who may not be familiar with DoD net, tell us what it is. Yeah, uh, no problem. And first off, good morning. Again, I'm Miguel Cerritos. So I run the operations group, and what DoDNet essentially is, it's a unified architecture environment. So what we do is we try to provide, you might hear the term common IT services, but essentially what we're looking at is what are those use cases that are across the fourth estate that are being done by all, by, by multiple agencies, and we try to provide some cohesiveness to that. In addition to that, what we also do is as we improve what we're doing for our customer base, they're actually providing more lethality to the warfighter. And so right now, our environment is uh, made up mostly of DISA, JSQ Doden, DTIC, and others. And I'll get a little bit more into that a little bit later. But again, what we really want to do is make sure that we provide a single unified IT service solution. Uh, part of that solution allows us to introduce things like a unified tier one service desk. And then another addition to that is that we also bring behind that the power of DISA. And what that means is we leverage the circuits, we leverage other organizations. You're going to hear me talk about a little bit later about Thunderdome and things of that nature, where we're able to bring the power to bear of the entire agency. And that is actually able to then allow us to provide those common, uh, and not only common, but also evolved and modernized solutions to all of our customers. That's great. And can you tell us a little bit about the state of the program right now? Absolutely. So today we're made up of three general customers. They're just a JFQ Doden. Also, we have Defense Technical Information Center, known as DTIC, and we also have Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, DPAA, and they're our main customer base. And they're actually using our services both across Nipper as well as Zipper today. And we're also uh, both supporting both CONUS and OCONUS user populations across that. Um, with that, we have a user base of about 30,000 users across those, both those enclaves. We're supporting them both from an accreditation perspective. We provide them their endpoints. We're 
which means that we provide them a common baseline of applications. Within that, for example, we're able to provide them access to cloud-based services, both IL-2, IL-5, and IL-6 regarding office suites. And so from that perspective, again, we're able to uh, take off quite a bit of workload for them, provide them a common uh, IT platform, which allows them to, each of these organizations, to focus in on their mission, which is really what we want to do, because that improves the entire department. That's great. And so as we continue to work on these migrations, Chad, can you tell us a little bit about um, the benefits that our future migrated customers will see? Sure. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, as Miguel mentioned, uh, roughly 30,000 30, plus, uh, you know, accounts and users across Nipper and Sipper. And, you know, as we think about what we're trying to do here, uh, bringing in all of the different DAFAs and organizations on there, part of that is how do we ensure the environment is ready to be scaled, uh, be able to support that. We have redundancy throughout that. So as we think about kind of what, you know, customers can expect, you know, part of that is innovation and transformation that's happening across DODNet. So as you scale from a 30,000 user base to a 60,000 or 100,000 user base, they can expect equal or better service as they migrate onto those services. Some of the things we're doing that, that Molly mentioned earlier is we think about what we're calling generation two release one as sort of that next generation of what DODNet is. And part of that's moving into that cloud, so setting up a cloud architecture and framework, adding in some of those automations um, and innovations there from that standpoint. How do we make it easier on the end user in terms of the support that they provide from the user experience, but also from an operation standpoint with Miguel's team in terms of, you know, how do we start to streamline that? How do we start to make it where, you know, those teams are really focused on being more uh, predictive in terms of identifying things early on um, to make it a seamless user experience across the board, just to name a few examples. Anything you want to add, Jonathan? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, as we look forward uh, in, in terms of adding new capabilities and bringing on uh, the DAFAs, it's really critical that we inject the technology required to be able to scale efficiently, uh, to operate effectively, as well as uh, to provide the services that uh, the DAFAs need to support their mission, right? Uh, so there's a, a kind of a duality between uh, supporting uh, and providing common IT and unifying the environment uh, as much as possible, as well as understanding the particular needs of each agency and being able to fill those so that, that way they can focus on their mission. Great. And Miguel, can you tell us what some of your recent milestones are? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the great things is that we're always growing. And next we work on the precipice of doing more migrations. So right now we're working with, uh, for example, Defense Media Activity. We're also working with Defense Contract Auditing Agencies, Defense Contract Management Agency. We're also working with Defense Microelectronics Activity and, uh, and others. And so we're going to continue to grow. And what we're looking at is to expand to uh, over 300,000 users, actually, in, in this phase. But that's actually really exciting because it provides so much opportunity. And that's also why it's so important that we take advantage of things of new technologies like automation and things of that nature. So this type of event here allows us to also bring in other uh, partners. For example, our Lighthouse partners have actually brought in more solutions that have removed some of the legacy technologies of our environment and actually uh, allowed us to be on the to be more advanced. Um, in addition to that, some of the other achievements that we did just last year as an example is we did retire some legacy environments. For example, in DISA, we had a corporate network called DISA Net. I got to be a, an operator of that environment early in my career, over 20 years of, of doing it. Well, I actually put it to bed because we were able to move on into DOD Net. Um, in addition to that, we were able to um, allow our customers to be on Windows 11 across both platforms. We were able, as part of that, to also migrate them. I think we were one of the first to migrate them onto Dios on the IL-6 environment. And with that, we also brought in the new application Office 365 Suite, which allows them to do more cohesive workloads. Uh, so for example, you know, we, we saw the advantages of teams and collaboration on the Nipper side. Now we are able to provide that also on the Zipper side for our customers. And that's going to allow them to, again, improve their workload, improve their, their mission for their customers. So it's, again, it's really great for what we can do because it really empowers the customer to, to provide their services. 
I mean, that sounds like a great customer solution. And Chad, did you have something yeah, yeah, to if add? Yeah, if yes. I can add to that too. So I think one of the other things um, too, just to, to piggyback on, on Miguel's comment is, you know, back at the end of May, uh, early June, um, we also kind of hit our initial operating capability uh, for some of those new technologies and capabilities, rolling out a virtual desktop as a service solution, that cloud-based solution. So some of those things that we're looking at, you know, in addition to, to what Miguel mentioned in terms of how do we start to posture for those migrations? How do we make it easier for the users to come on board and kind of opening up those, the capabilities and apertures for a wider, broader user base, uh, as Miguel noted? So, Given all of the capabilities that we have, how do, what initiatives do we have in place to get uh, users migrated uh, more quickly? Sure, so I'll take that. Uh, so uh, as, as Miguel and Chad mentioned, uh, this last year has been uh, quite eventful, right? So we had the retirement uh, of the legacy network, uh, DISA.net, and the migration of all of, of DISA uh, proper over to DODNet. Uh, that was a significant activity. Uh, we took uh, the lessons learned from that uh, and really focused down on uh, a more modern uh, environment. So the, as DODNet was built, uh, the underlying technology has significantly changed, particularly when it comes to the management of endpoints as well as the management of, of large-scale networks. So looking at those technologies, we also looked at the, the DAFA's roadmaps and, and found ways that we can also help them accelerate that technology injection through the migration. Uh, we really wanted to focus that the migrations were helping the DAFAs and the department move forward uh, technologically. So uh, we, we deployed unified endpoint management uh, supported uh, by Intune and uh, Jamf. Uh, that's going to allow us to more effectively manage uh, the endpoints, be able to provide a more customized experience, uh, but with a common architecture. Uh, secondly, uh, as, as Chad mentioned, uh, we've deployed a virtual desktop as a service capability, uh, which is highly scalable uh, and, and very efficient. Uh, that will also allow us to provide a customized experience for the individual DAFAs to have their own DAFA networks uh, connected, their own applications deployed, uh, but nonetheless maintain a, a common architecture. Uh, another key capability uh, was automation uh, that's supported by uh, Ansible Automation Platform and our uh, J9 hack uh, Vulkan uh, counterparts. Uh, and so that was a critical capability uh, to bring in to be able to scale uh, the changes on the network, uh, the changes on the devices uh, very efficiently and effectively. Uh, as we kind of look towards the DAFAs that uh, Miguel mentioned, you know, DCA, DCMA, um, DLA, uh, they have huge, huge presence, right? A huge footprint, tons of sites. Uh, so being able to uh, provide that common architecture, but as well uh, support the clip of change that is going to happen uh, is really critical that we, we injected uh, an automation capability uh, there. Another key component uh, was migrating to Infoblox, uh, so far more robust uh, network management solution uh, and give, gives us uh, better redundancy, better resiliency, and also ultimately will help us uh, further our efforts to completely move to the cloud. Um, so that's kind of uh, the main focus areas. Uh, there are definitely uh, quite a lot of other capabilities we continue to, to roll out. Uh, and now, uh, now that we've achieved uh, you know, operational capability for those components, we're, we're looking forward, moving on to, to our next release um, here in the near future. And I think just to add to that, I think one of, one of the important things, right, that, that Jonathan mentioned was um, sort of the unique environments of the DAFA. So we understand that everyone's got a unique mission. They're coming onto a common architecture, common platform, but it's really important as we kind of work through that, you know, planning and design phase and kind of work through that onboarding journey with each of the DAFAs to understand the nuances of their environment and their network and really how do we make that user experience really, really kind of benefit there. So each time we go in there, really kind of sitting down with the organizations, understanding how they operate, understanding their mission, and really accounting for all of that as we work through that process to really help make sure that's a, that's a, um, a solid experience. We're doing some of that stuff, right, by taking a look at um, 
uh, you know, data, data. So we're trying to use data-driven insights. We're trying to use some different user experience tools and techniques to really understand what that baseline is, what that user experience is. So we kind of have that before and after measure. So as you start to move through this journey with them, we have those metrics and those key performance indicators really to evaluate how we're performing, where there's areas for improvement, and kind of how we can continue to really focus on the user experience through that, that onboarding journey. Okay, that's great, appreciate that. Um, and I know, I know, Jonathan, you touched some on resiliency and redundancy. Do you have any additional information you could share about scalability to DODNet? Absolutely. Uh, as we are kind of uh, on the precipice of migrating a significant portion of the DAFA users, uh, one of the key components was how do we make DODNet truly scalable? Uh, so the legacy architecture, the on-prem architecture, uh, had the ability to scale, but that scaling was um, challenging, clunky, and also uh, provided you know, several operational challenges. So part of our efforts in R2 was in, in moving to the cloud was also to allow us to be able to scale not just the physical uh, architecture, uh, but also the actual operations. Uh, and that's what's really important is that uh, the capabilities we delivered were not just technology. They were also people and process driven uh, to be able to more effectively operate and manage the environment. That's great, appreciate that. Okay, one last question. So if you're not currently scheduled to move on to DODNet, Miguel, can you still use the DODNet services? Yeah, the short answer is yes. So uh, that, that's the great part of this whole thing is that what we do is what we work with each of the customers and we really go through the planning. We want to understand the business processes. We really want to understand how you're doing it. Chad had mentioned the, those nuances. So for example, when we look at applications, we, uh, we want to understand what applications you're using on the endpoints. Those endpoints and those applications, we understand are probably uh, accessing some of those mission IT platforms and we're going to support the, the endpoints to be able to do that. In addition to that, we also organize integration planning meetings where we go over things, for example, the network. So there's a form and a prerequisite list that we have on our DNet portal page. We'll actually will walk you through that. Part of that will be so that we can identify points of contact to establish how we're going to actually do the planning with you. Uh, with that information, so for example, when we uh, go over the network piece, our network engineers will work with you to get information, and we'll be able to also bring in other partners across this, such as Thunderdome and others, to understand how we're going to then work over the virtual routings and things of that nature. Um, we're also going to talk about what can we do to make sure that those endpoints themselves, you're, when you acquire them, we're going to provide you an access to a catalog, which we're able to share as to how can you get a better purchasing power for what you're going to buy for your, for your, actually your customers, for your, uh, your employees and staff members as well. And then we're going to again walk through all that with you so that you have a total package and are part of the process so that this isn't happening to you, but th that we're, it's more of a team cooperative effort and it's a very collaborative effort along the way. So it, it requires a lot of communication as we're going through each step of the way of doing this. And I, and I think some of the great things that uh, Jonathan mentioned, for example, is virtual desktop as a service, it might allow new opportunities. So for example, in that service, one of the things that can be done is that you may be able to go and instead of having to purchase a GFE for your employees, you may be able to simply allow them the ability to access a virtual desktop off of their home computer. Now that may mean for you that you no longer have to pay that extra dollar figure for that single employee, saving who knows how much money for, your, for you and your staff and your organization, which you can then reutilize for other purposes. So again, those are great things I think that, that we're able to do. And as we find more opportunities across the way, I think that we're gonna allow, again, our customers to, again, provide more lethality to the warfighter. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was going to add, so I, I think what's uh, been really helpful for us uh, over this past year is as we've kind of looked through uh, and discovered the DAFIS network, we've taken in their requirements and a part of that has informed our roadmap. Uh, VDAS is a great example of that. So DISA already had uh, a, a VDI uh, offering uh, on DODNet, uh, but as we looked at the DAFAs, we understood uh, some particularly had critical needs uh, in terms of scalability that our current environment just could not support effectively. Uh, so that's where we, we uh, moved that capability to the cloud, uh, automated a significant portion of the overall management uh, and reporting structure for that, uh, and then 
Now that's going to allow the other DAFAs uh, a service that they can consume on DODnet as well. And I think that's really critical in terms of the whole 4 uh, you know, goal is that each DAFA, as we add capabilities for a particular DAFA, that can also then translate to support another DAFA where it's a capability perhaps they didn't offer or weren't able to offer it uh, at the scale and um, effectiveness that we can as a group. So I think you know, as we look forward uh, to adding additional capabilities onto DODNet, having that feedback loop of understanding, you know, what is on the DAFA's roadmap, what is, uh, what is next, uh, is going to be really critical and really helpful, I think, to the agencies themselves, uh, allowing them to focus on their mission, but nonetheless continuing to bring new innovations and capabilities. Appreciate that. Um, as we wrap up here, I just want to check with our panel to see if you have any last minute takeaways you want to share with the group. Anything we may not have touched on? Yeah, I think uh, that every day is a, is a new opportunity and what we're doing here is just evolving. So when we were looking at the roadmap, one of the things that I think we were trying to iterate was that it was not about one final end state, but about revi revisions. So we talked about generation one and now we're on the precipice of generation two R1, which basically infers that we have next steps for R2 and R3. And by doing that, just like Jonathan had mentioned, is that what we, what's important is that we listen. And so, you know, on the operations side, we get information about incident tickets or requests and change requests. But as part of the planning side, we also look now at the mission that's what's happening at the other agencies. And all that information gets colluded together, and we're able to create a, a better roadmap for the future. So even I think what's great about this program is that it's not simply about one single end state, it's about evolution ultimately. And we're able to incorporate uh, new things, whether they come from the Zero Trust framework, whether they come from Thunderdome, like I said earlier, or Enterprise ICAM, or just those efficiencies that are coming from the JWCC and things that are coming with from DOS, et cetera. That allows us to grow more and more. And so one of the good, uh, one of also great things is our partnership with the rest of DISA. And our, um, when we do that, for example, I know DISA is a big place, but we're able to do that. We're able actually to walk through different customers and, and actually say, okay, you actually were working with this organization already. Well, so do we. Let's take that off your plate. We're actually going to, for example, take on the circuits or take on those other parts of it and, again, lighten that load for that, uh, that agency specifically so that they can, again, continue to focus on what, what's important to them, which is, the, which is the mission. But, again, I think that that ability to evolve, to modernize, to always grow is, is just something that's uh, it's really great for us. I think, I think you bring up some excellent points, Miguel. Appreciate that. Yeah, just one, one thing to add to that, too, you know, as we look out over the horizon, you know, as Miguel's saying, you know, transparency and partnership is huge, right? As we go out on these, on these onboarding journeys with each of the DAFAs, it's really about being transparent with the, with the organizations, kind of what to expect, when to expect it, what to think about in each phase of that process as we work through that journey. And the partnership that Miguel mentioned, obviously within DISA, but also with the DAFA. So, you know, one of the big focus areas that we've had as we've been out there is making sure that it's not just we're uh, impressing upon them, this is what we're doing and how we're doing it. It's we really spend the time to sit down and walk them through it, understand it, and really partner with them, right, along the way. So that way we're starting to thread that between the partnership with DISA and the services there, the partnership with the DAFA is being part of that process. They buy off and sign off on the planning and design work that we're doing. So in each phase, we've got those gates with the DAFA to ensure there's transparency, there's buy-in across the board. So as we work through that process, it becomes very effective and efficient for those organizations. Yeah, and I think one thing I wanted to add there is one of the things that we are internally working on a lot is there sometimes is the thought of subjective versus objective information. And so analytical data is really important to us. Uh, some of the things that Jonathan spoke about are these tool sets. But part of that journey was that we want to make sure we were able to breed uh, analytical data. And we want to create dashboards such as user experience and things of that nature back to uh, not just to us, but also to the agency. You know, we talk a lot to uh, uh, our director about just the importance of live information and making sure it's accessible. Uh, when we first adopted, for example, our um, ticketing system, we were able to create uh, ticketing dashboards for our customers, which they are able to leverage. But that gives you reactive data right after the fact. Now we're trying to figure out how we can get proactive data to you mm -hmm. so that you're able to see that. And that's actually, I think, a big demand is to how do we 
ensure that tra transparency is happening all across the through, not just from what happens before the migration, but what happens after migration as part of sustainment as well. And so that is something that we have definitely tr um, listened to and are developing solutions for uh, each time of it. So I think that's going to be very helpful. Great. Any, anything else you want to add, uh, Jonathan? So just about the data perspective, because that is a that is an area of, of key focus we, we didn't really touch on. So uh, particularly around end user sentiment data uh, has been a, a key focus area to uh, get telemetry data from the, the endpoint devices themselves. Uh, so that way we can begin to effectively look at the user experience, understand it, uh, and and look at it from different angles, whether that be users at a particular site, users on a, on a particular device, uh, users using a particular application, uh, or have you know particular configurations. Uh, all of that data uh, we've been collecting, and, and as Miguel alluded to, we have a user experience dashboard uh, that we can customize by DAFA. Uh, that's going to allow, you know, obviously DISA as a whole to look at that and, and improve our service, uh, but also uh, the DAFAs themselves to be able to understand their operational environment. Uh, we're looking at deploying that uh, forward of a migration so that way we can collect a, a very accurate picture before the, the migration as well as after. Uh, and so understanding the end user experience, um, you know, from, you know, as Miguel mentioned, right, a, a data perspective, at least as objective as it can be, uh, is going to be really important to be able to put those things into the roadmap to be able to, to improve. That's great. So as we close out today's session, there's a couple of key points I did want to just re-emphasize. So a couple of things that Miguel said that this is an evolution. So um, we're not trying to just reach an endpoint. We're trying to continue to evolve and grow and make this um, the best uh, end user product. So I think you'll, we'll continue to see increased growth in those areas uh, you know, throughout the evolution of that. And then another point I did wanna just reiterate and touch on is the, the communication and partnership. It really is a communication, or excuse me, it is a partnership with our DAFAs. We work closely with them. We will continue to ensure that we're representing and providing the best product uh, available. And I think uh, those are two key takeaways I just wanna drive home before we end today. So. Um, I'd like to thank our panel here. Thank you for taking the time to speak to everyone. And I'd like to also thank our audience for um, uh, getting up so early and uh, being with us. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we have a few minutes if we want to open it up for some questions. Yes. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Josh Ainsworth. I work at the Disson North Com field office. Let me fix this. Okay. A um, couple questions. Do you know when DODNet will become available for COCOMs? Um, I know the COCOM that we support, Northcom, is very interested. Um, some of their constraints are obviously like budgetary type issues internally, but I was wondering if you could speak to that across the board. Um, also, um, if you could verify like DODNet, like Thunderdome will be integrated into DODNet. I think that's a huge huge feature and like can you speak to that as well is it like the pricing structure is it is it like just by default included you have to pay extra for it stuff like that um, and also the tier one support is it going to be integrated into the global service desk um, or is it going to be run under the program I've heard kind of rumors either way so I'm just kind of you know, you know looking for clarification thank you so I, I can address your first question sir about um, DOD net being added to the COCOM so um, our best estimate due to the acquisition strategy would be um, uh, fiscal year 26 is when we would be looking at that. Yeah, I'll take the questions about Thunderdome and things of that nature. So for Thunderdome, yes. What we do is we just integrate as part of our, of, of our architecture inherently. So when you get our service and you get our network services, we actually do deploy the Thunderdome technologies themselves. So the Versa boxes and all the rest of it, we, we work with them. In fact, we also take that information from the site. So if it's a potentially legacy, we'll already have it, or if we'll work with the mission partner POC to then translate the information back to Thunderdome. And we'll also bring Thunderdome directly to the table as well, because they want to be at the table and go over the migration schedule. And so that, that allows that, again, that I think more seamless transition to the new technology. We actually were able to migrate uh, not just our headquarters, but I think also DBA's headquarters and other various locations.
locations. We have, I think, next month I was looking for August, I think three more migrations happening scheduled. So we're continually growing and expanding Thunderdome on both classifications, Nipper as well as Sipper. And for your question about tier one services, so what we do is we do leverage the global services tier one. Uh, that tier one is a common platform service. And then what they're able to do as a result of that is that they are able to also leverage and go into other mission partners, other environments, so that they're able to bring more cohesion as to that resolution. So for example, if you did have, uh, as, a cons as a customer, had a ticket, and the ticket was having to do with perhaps a email situation, that tier one manager and that tier one service that's operator will be able to know, okay, this issue actually is going to be best provided by the by the DO service desk, and they're going to provide a more rapid response to it. So even if the issue may not inherently be with us, because we do provide that common platform, it allows that service desk member to be able to translate that information to the proper group for a quicker time of resolution. And one of the things that we do look at right now is like is really a speed, a speed of uh, time to resolution, speed of request, things of that nature. So we really want to continue to do that and foster that. Yeah, and just uh, before Jonathan jumps in, just one thing on that. So, you know, if you if you go out on on the DISA date lines or DISA site, right, on, on Nipper, um, you can find out what's included in that seat. So, if you think about DoDNet, the way it's it's done now, you have seat rates essentially, right? And as part of that, you can see what's included in those rates, um, both from a service can a standpoint, capability standpoint. It'll kind of lay that out there, <coughs> excuse me, across the Nipper and Zipper environments to give you a better picture of what's included, Thunderdome and other things like that. So you can kind of see what's included in that whole service offering. Yeah, to add a little bit uh, around this is your zero trust strategy and DoD net. Uh, so as Miguel mentioned, right, uh, as a part of the DoD net uh, capability, we are deploying uh, Thunderdome uh, or the zero trust solution. Uh, in terms of migration strategies, uh, leaning forward and deploying uh, the SASE and SD-WAN capability uh, to be able to provide DAFNet connectivity to the endpoint as well as point-to-point -point connectivity uh, to any other uh, site on DoDNet is one of the first things that we are doing uh, as a part of that network migration. Um, so Thunderdome is an integral part uh, to the overall DoDNet strategy. And as Miguel mentioned, you know, integrations either with DOS or ICAM or J9, uh, it's really, uh, you know, all of this uh, strategy uh, and bringing those capabilities together uh, to be able to provide, you know, the best, uh, best offering, best service, best in class. Yeah, and I think I didn't, I forgot to pat ourselves on the back, but one of the things that we did, for example, recently is we actually deployed the, the SASE agent. Uh -huh. So right now, if you acquire our service, uh, part of that service actually already includes as part of the baseline, that SASE agent. There's nothing additional to be done. You just can acquire service and you get that right out of the box. Okay, great. Any additional questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. We appreciate your time. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions afterwards. Thank you. All right. Thanks.